I love romantic meeting stories, like Forget Paris, Billy Crystal. Hey everybody, if you haven't heard of this week's movie, I suggest you get nice and toasty and go check out Netflix because I'm thinking of ending things is a mind blower of a movie. And we're going to try to figure out, I'm going to try and figure out what that means. And I have some assistance, as always. I'm hoping he doesn't bring me down. Andy Pesha is also on the podcast tonight. Sand is overrated. It's just tiny little rocks. Is your uh, mind blown still from this movie, Andy? Or, uh, you know, do we need to uh, do we need to address the elephant in the room? Uh, dude, I, I've still been, uh, how many days has it been now? We watched it like three, four days ago, and I still have been trying. It was last night. <laughs> oh, was it? <laughs> Shit, man, time warp. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's uh, it's one of those cerebral films that I wouldn't expect you to uh, find on your own and watch if it wasn't for the fact that Charlie Kaufman wrote and directed this film. Yeah, I love Charlie Kaufman. Yeah, and he's, he's of course, famous for doing movies that are usually about a male protagonist that's life is falling apart. Um, but in this one, he chose a female protagonist who's dealing with a male protagonist's life falling apart. Uh, more on the symbolism later. Yeah, but yeah, the the movie is is a head trip, a mind fuck, if you will, to put it in your terms. I think I turned around at least like three, four times with the "what the fuck" look to you while we we're watching in the studio. Yeah, I don't like it when you do that. Well, I mean, I, I'm just trying to somebody to hold my hand figuratively. You no, know, it's just your face. Oh, okay. Well, I can deal with that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's a Netflix release. It's a, it's a weird Charlie Kaufman film. And that's almost a redundancy to say, um, it's about a young woman who travels with a new boyfriend to, uh, meet his parents on this secluded farm in the middle of nowhere. It seems like it might be in like Oklahoma or Nebraska or one of the middle states. Yeah. Um, and then she gets there and she doesn't know what the hell's going on and neither does the audience. Uh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> But in a great way, I think, because you you come to expect this kind of film from this uh, former only screenwriter who uh, his his credits, you know, I don't want to go right to the, the things that people know, but I'll say um, most things that you would probably know. Andy. So I, I would say you probably know Charlie Kaufman best from A Turtle Sunshine and Spotless Mind, mm -hmm. uh, being on being John Malkovich adaptation. And then the, the lesser known uh, films you probably haven't seen, like Schenectady, New York, or Cynic Dosh, however the hell you say that. Um, Ada and Human Nature, probably haven't seen that one. I watched uh, Anomalisa, though, because uh, oh. that was nominated for, for you know, um, the Academy Awards when it came out. So I remember having to watch that. So you named the big three, and then plus Anomalisa is what I know. Him I for. think we did Anomalisa on a podcast that year, too. Yeah, I'm probably. Not mistaken. Yeah. I mean, I know we, we should have, or we would have if it was if it was during this podcast or we weren't on a hiatus. But he um to make the leap from being a screenwriter and such a an amazing, amazingly talented and creative, I I think he's probably the most creative screenwriter that's working today. You know, you have people like Aaron Sorkin who are just so great with words and adaptations. He doesn't do a lot of his own material anymore. You know, he's he's my favorite working screenwriter today. But just in terms, Charlie Kaufman, his, the worlds that he builds seemingly out of his own brain, even though this was based on a book and adaptation was based on a book. But he takes the book and, and the novelization and just throws it out of the window and the window's closed. So yeah. he just breaks the fucker wide open. And you go, it's not even like the author, I imagine, of these books that he he adapts, the author must go, OK, I, I have no clue what you were adapting because it, the characters are in there, I think. But, yeah. you know, in adaptation, he he had he adapted the or the orchid thief and he put himself into the narrative, the narrative of him of Charlie Kaufman has to adapt The Orchid Thief. So he put himself into the narrative of his screenplay. And that's just a great, brilliant oh, yeah. idea. You know, so, and something else like being John Malkovich, where you take an, uh, an actor like John Malkovich and you say, well, what if we were able to go inside of his head and live as part of, or see the see see the 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 world through John Malkovich, the real John Malkovich's eyes? I mean, these are ideas that I I could never come up with. I mean, I don't think so. I think that's why I find them most intriguing because they're so in, insanely creative. And I guess I'm just not that weird. 
Well, I mean, I don't know. It's, and you're mentioning the movies, and then when you, when you're mentioning adaptation, like out of all the movies, like that was the even though, like you said, he put himself in there, which wasn't, of course, part of the novel. I felt like that one was like the most on the nose, and like everyone else has just been every other movie he's uh, written has just been. All right, what does this really mean? What is this really, where does this really go? I, well, Eternal Sunshine, I would think, is his most straightforward movie, though, because it's about a relationship breaking up. And what if you could go and go to a company and they could re, you know, uh, erase all your thoughts from that relationship? That's that's a bit more straightforward to me than jumping inside the body of John Malkovich. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But you just said the opposite. No, no, I said no, no. I said the adaptation was like its most normal Oh, one geez. for me. My God. <laughs> and I love adaptation. I've seen that uh, film. A, okay. A okay. Then times. I, then I agree actually, because it's more, there's nothing that really fan, there's nothing really fantasy that happens that couldn't really happen in reality in adaptation. So yeah. I guess that's what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you know, he seemingly went down this rabbit hole, um, after he became, he got the reins himself, like all writers eventually do. He gets enough clout and uh, enough studio backing for his, his successful projects, they decided to let him direct something that he wrote. And he started out with uh, Cynic Doche, New York. Again, apologies. I don't know how you say it. I've seen the movie, too. I think twice. it's Connecticut. Right? I think it is, too. But I don't know. Um, I don't know. Whatever. That's It might be. It might not. That's what Charlie Coffin's all about. So weird. But you, you take a movie like that, and it's so high concept, and it's kind of like this movie, I'm thinking of Ending Things, where you... You have a lot of symbolism. You don't know what's real. You don't know what's not real. You have a lot of great actors in it. Great, interesting dialogue. But don't try and figure this out. Just let it go over you like a warm bath or a blanket and then make sense of it after you've seen it. Yeah, I totally agree. Like I, I wanted, I, shame on me, but I wanted to watch it twice before the, the podcast. I only watched it the one time with you. And like even... I think it was just like that feeling like I, I, I did midway, like stop trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And I was like, well, I guess the, hopefully if they tie it up, you know, they tie it up in the end or you, you know, they give you enough uh, clues to figure it out on your own. If not, I'm going to be super fucking pissed. But <laughs> Well, know? yeah, I mean, it's it's, a, it's not an easy film to watch. Um, I'm thinking of ending things. It's a film that, you know, from the description, a uh, couple goes home to meet guys, parents for the first time except you see the parents in very strange circumstances. One, one scene they're young, one scene they're old, they're on their deathbed eventually. Um, it, it doesn't seem like it's, it's in the same time zone that we live in. It seems like it's in a different world altogether and you kind of are in like a time warp. Yeah. You know, but it's in an even weirder kind of David Lynchian universe where you don't know what all this weirdness means, but it's almost like a horror film. I, that's why I was asking. Cause I didn't, I still haven't looked up anything. I didn't look up anything about the film. I just saw the preview on, uh, on Netflix. And that's why I was like, that was one of the times when I turned, I was like, is this a horror film? Is this a thriller? What the fuck is going on here? Cause I had no, no clue. Cause you know, like the other cop movies, yeah, they were very, you know, mind trippy and mind blowing or esoteric, but you still kind of knew what you were going for with the movie. You know, if yeah. this, I was I didn't have no idea. I didn't have any idea where it was going on. Yeah. And that's kind of why I liked it. I mean, it'll probably end up being one of my favorite movies of the year just because it has this kind of punk rock, take no, give no fucks attitude to it where it's you're on this you're on this movie ride with me and you trusted me before to be really weird you know, it. my mind did wander into territory where I'm going, well, somebody needs to rein him back a little bit because this is a little bit too weird. A couple times, but then it came back around and went, no, it's not. This is, this is fucking brilliant because it's not weird for weird's sake. It's all very laid out. It's plot driven of the mind. I like to think of it where it's for the audience to interpret it's not that hard, or I don't, I don't think it's that hard to interpret what's going on, especially after you've seen the movie. But the possibilities are endless with the symbolism. It's sort of the the best parts of when in high school when they give you the the classic and they say interpret what the author was thinking. And I always thought that was bullshit because it's like, well, I, I can give you a guess, but you know, we're not going to dig up Jane Austen. Yeah. You know, you don't know what she was thinking any better than I do, so you can't give me any letter grade besides an A. And I usually got an A because I said that. But this you know, the film asks a lot of the audience to just be patient and then some fucked up shit happens. And, and in a good way, you kind of, it's, it reminded me of Shakespeare because when I, when I first studied the Shakespeare's plays, 
I remember thinking you pay so much attention to every word and every syllable, you miss what the what what's really going on or the biggest picture. And if you try and do that, then you don't get the the, you know, the symphonic beauty of of his language. And in this, if you try to do that, you you miss the language. But also, you know, the situation and and the the world that he created in this movie, which is so unique, you kind of miss it if you pay attention too much. That that makes sense because you're it's it's like one of those three D art things. It's so close to you, but you're missing everything because you're just so focused on that one spot. Well, yeah, I mean, you just have to pretty much rely on the fact that you're not going to get it the first time. Um, and that's what makes it so much more fun. It's, it's definitely a three, four Peter kind of movie. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one that's always going to give until you make your mind up on what it's about. Um, which is probably why it alienates a lot of normal movie goers, not saying like yourself, um, but to hold you to that standard, you know, to have patience for a film like this, I I had patience for it, but yet I I like a lot of movies like this. I like the slower, more narrative films that don't have a lot of action. And, you know, it's basically just characters talking to each other and then amazing visuals and great beats along the way that sort of keep your mind going and, and give your give your mind enough, you know, to put it at ease. Also, if it's going to be as smart as this movie is, you don't ever want to get to a place where you're smarter than your audience because then your audience is like, fuck you, yeah. you know? And this was, this was on in that dangerous territory where I could see people thinking, fuck you, because they, oh, this is just being arty for art's sake or that he, you know, he's, he, he thinks that we're, we, we won't get this and I don't get this. Um, but I don't think it's that kind of, I don't think it's that kind of film. I think, again, if you, if you analyze the actual goings on of the movie, it's pretty straightforward and it's not, it's not overly smart. Yeah, I think like if, for me personally, I like whodunits. I like psychological thrillers. I like trying to figure out where, you know, the characters or where the story is going. So if you if you're a fan of that, I, I think you're going to like I like this movie um, after watching. it. I think you're going to like this movie. Now, the people that like, you know, just want comedies or things that, you know, like Marvel movies where you don't really have to think you just put it on for enjoyment. They're not going to like this. You're going to have to want to go on a sort of a uh, sort of a mental ride. Not saying, you you know, you have to be smart to figure it out or or whatever like that. But I think you you would have to be in the mindset like, hey, this one's a thinker, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, if you think of other films, I, I was trying to think of other films to to pair this with as sort of a double feature because um, it's sort of like an ambiguous film. I would consider it, you know, it's you know how like Inception had that ambiguous ending with the top. Yeah. You know, where you don't know what happens. This whole film is kind of like ambiguous because you could, it's open to interpretation from the the author and the audience. So, you know, I, I could keep my list of similar films to kind of, you know, newer films, I would say. And new for me is like anything post-1939. Yeah. Okay, um, cool. But, me too. Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like Inception did come to mind, but just the ending. Um, but then really movies like uh, American Psycho, you oh, know, yeah. it's kind of ambiguous. You don't really know if that reality happened. Everything you were watching to Patrick Bateman's character yeah, one movie I thought about, I still haven't seen it, but we did a podcast on it. You remember that uh, we did a, like this year, Vivarium? For me, it seemed like this one had kind of, I mean, that was more like sci fi. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, with uh, Imogen Poots and, uh, and uh, Jesse, Jesse Eisenberg. Eisenberg. Yeah, yeah it, it really did feel like that too. Um, except, you know, this is obviously a, a way better done movie with a bigger budget and a more talented yeah. Uh, director. Um, but yeah, very, very similar to that movie, Vivarium. Um, also, you know, a movie like 2001 A Space Odyssey, you know, it kind of reminded me of because there was a tension that was building kind of in the silence, just like Hal in 2001. You know, the, the sort of the character you follow is a young lady in this who is seemingly the main character, but the, it's about the world that her boyfriend lives in. So you don't really know if she's the main character or not, or it's Jesse Plemons' character. So everything that unfolds unfolds very slowly and silently. It's so eerie. It's like a horror film because you think somebody's going to jump out and just stab somebody at some oh, point. I thought that the whole time. Yeah. And, and you know, it's not a horror film. It's, and nobody stabs anybody, but when you're done with it, you kind of feel like you're mentally, you've mentally been wounded because of 
how intense it is. I mean, I found myself exhausted after watching it in one of those great ways where if I, I wish I could have seen this in the theater because that's a hell of a ride home. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> you know, you know, if you're going to crash off a bridge or you need to pull over for five minutes and cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that would have been trippy to see. Or feel theater. inspired, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just weird. I don't know. <laughs> Today's episode of the Four Seasons of Film podcast is brought to you by Phil's Coffee. Phil's specializes in handcrafted coffee made one cup at a time. Visit a location today or find them on the web at philscoffee.com. That's Phil's with a Z, coffee.com. Find the beans you're looking for. Hey, did you ever see Mul- uh, Mulholland Drive? Um, it's a great David Lynch movie. I well, I probably did a long time ago but i don't remember it right this and this felt like the most like david lynchian um that kaufman's done yes because lynch is known for doing weird you know out there stuff i mean he famously you know uh i I think it's lost highway where halfway through the film he changes actors for the same role and doesn't even mention it it's just a new person (laughs) you know that sounds very much like uh like this movie we're talking about you know i i I almost thought that was going to happen and in a weird way, they do have like the the weird Oklahoma dance sequence where they do change characters yeah, for right. a little bit, you know, and then, then then they're back again. So yeah, definitely some David Lynchian stuff in there. Um, I think I think I like this movie better than I liked uh, Schenectady, New York, because that was his first uh, directorial debut, um, or that was his directorial debut. And and Anomalisa, I I fell in love with. I loved that movie, the stop yeah. motion in it and the emotion of it. This was just like, you know, the the third, he's culminating his voice as a director. He knows who he is as a writer. Um, so I think it's, you know, he's just going to get better at what he does based on this material and just keep tightening and keep uh, heightening what we expect from him as an audience, almost like Hitchcock or, you know, or, or like a Scorsese where I'm going to look forward to his movies because like Kubrick too, you're they're They're going to be stranger and weirder and better every at every outing. Yeah. And I think, you know, he's he's definitely turning into one of my favorite. He's, he was always one of my favorite writers, but now he's he's one of my favorite writer directors because of the chances and the the choices and how daring he is. You know that it it's it's my favorite part of filmmaking when you can kind of just be this maverick, especially nowadays when you can get this material across the desk and somebody wants to make it. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. Imagine being in that pitch meeting, right? <laughs> you know, this is like, you don't know what's happening. You just, you'd have to be like, Charlie, don't fuck with me. Just tell me what the uh. movie's about. <laughs> and he's like, ah, 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 I can't do that. Uh, but I mean, I guess we, you know, we're, we're to a point where we need to talk about what the movie is really about, the symbolism. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear your take on it. <laughs> that, well, there is no wrong answer, but, you know, I mean... I want you to just go out there. I want you to really like dig. dig. I hope you've been thinking about it. I I did afterwards, and especially when you're like, if I I was wanted to watch it again, just be so I could see if my uh, what I've come up with in my mind gels with the story. But right, because every scene there's seemingly something about it that you're trying to figure out what is this and what what is this really trying to say, and it's all one small piece that adds up to one big whole, and so I really don't you know. I don't. I want. To, I want to hear your interpretation of the overall meaning of the film. Uh, so I think it really is about Jesse Plemons' character. I believe oh, uh, we can. We we can do say whatever now, right? We're in that zone. Uh, yeah, okay. we could always say whatever. Well, you know, what I'm saying it's our podcast. Well, but it's so I think, censor. I think he was the one. We were inside his mind the whole time, and he was like, and he was the one in the car at the end because either he was taking a break from work or. Because they kept showing the, the the janitor guy, which should have been Jesse Plemons, but it wasn't Jesse Plemons because, you know, he's looking at him. But I believe it's like a, about uh, a lost love. And he was reflecting on his uh, on his life while he was like, you know, in his car and couldn't get back in. Maybe he was locked out of the of the school or whatever or, or the gymnasium. And he just was that was the when your life flashes, uh, you know, before your eyes. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what I assessed, too. Um, I think the film is it takes place. Uh, in in the moments right before the janitor's character, i.e., Jake Jake's character, the 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 boyfriend character, uh, dies. I think what yeah. what goes through his mind before he dies, because the the symbolism of the car being you know covered in snow at the end, and him having sort of that attack, you know, at the beginning of the movie. Um, I think it yeah, it's it's a reflection on you know his his life and what he went through. 
but I don't I don't agree that the uh, it's a lost love. I think the girl in the story is is a is sort of like because they that she she goes into an environment where and she witnesses all the stages of his life at different points from his parents to visiting the frosty freeze or whatever the hell that was. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like his life, his, his past was flooding before his eyes and it was kind of, well, I wish I would have had a composite of this girl to help me go through all of these things. I don't think she actually existed. Really? Yeah. I think honestly, you know, because, you know, he kept meeting different girls throughout it was kind of like that was the best, you know, because because mom always kept saying, you know, he never brings anybody home. So it's almost like she added up to all all the women that he ever dated, plus what he really wanted in someone. And the fact that she she knew she she could quote verbatim what he already knew in his head. They're this they're they're to me, they're the same person. Yeah. He he is she and she is he in the movie, as trippy as that sounds. But she uh she it seems like he he invented this composite of the of the perfect person which knew everything that he did, so in essence is him. And I mean this was the other far out theory besides my first I believe my first theory, but my second theory was that it was actually her in the car that died and it was like her life before her eyes, and she was reliving the life of meeting her parent the parents. And seeing them grow old, but for some reason she didn't see him grow old because maybe it's something in her mind or anything. And, you know, she reflected the time back of, you know, like, because that's my biggest hang up is we're inside her head when she talks. Like when she keeps saying the name of the film, you know, and in her mind, she's like having a normal conversation with him or his family. And she's like in her back of her mind, like, I'm thinking of ending things. Like now you, it's like, why are we hearing that? There has to be a reason why we're hearing that. Your theory makes a lot of sense if they're one person in the same, because you would have access to both inner monologues. But I don't know, maybe she was taking a reaccount. You know, she went back to the school because she knows that after she left him that, you know, he, that he never uh, amounted to it, like to what they were, you know, like getting married and all that. He just became the janitor of the local town or whatever. Right. I, I see where you're saying. My, I think it still fits into my theory of them being the same person because, you know, the fact that she can hear his thoughts, you know, it's and quote everything and quote passages that he knows verbatim. She, in essence, would be she is in the car, too, at the end, you know, and there's sort of this this reference to. Well, why I disagree that that it's about her, it because of at the end, especially when it's it's focusing on him, and then he has that song from Oklahoma that he sings on stage, and then he gives that that speech at the end, you know, and and everybody sort of comes to term with his reality being kind of a working schizophrenic, you know, or you know what what ended up being his life was he became a janitor. Um, I don't know if you if you noticed this, but the end speech was completely a a reinterpretation of the last speech from A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe, where he's winning yeah. the Nobel Peace Prize. I didn't. I, didn't I mean, shot, that. it's almost shot for shot. So to me, what it's saying is, you know, uh, and he gives the same speech too. It's like the words from that speech. Oh, okay. And so again, it, it has to be about him because of that last scene. And to reference A Beautiful Mind, which is about John Nash, the mathematician who who lived and worked with known schizophrenia and ended up still winning a Nobel Peace Prize. The what that says about the character in this movie is maybe that's sort of kind of that what he that's what he wanted as validation to strive to be somebody who reached an enormous accolade like the Nobel Peace Prize. What makes it almost even more sad is that if we're talking about these were the last moments that went through his mind before he died, a poor janitor in a school parking lot, that makes it all the more sad. Yeah, no, it does. You know, know. it's like, yeah, that's, that's (laughs) some, that's some deep symbolism that I don't think a lot of people would pick up on the beautiful mind reference. Um, the references to Oklahoma, which I had to go back and watch, uh, the, the 19, uh, fifties version of the stage musical. That was interesting to me because in, I guess what he, I guess what Kaufman, I guess he's painting um, Jesse Plemons' character as the the heavy from Oklahoma. I can't remember what his name is, um, but he's he's he was played by uh, Rod Steiger in the movie, and he's kind of this like oh Rod Steiger, I love that guy. Uh, yeah, thank for thankfully pronounced his name right this time. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, he, he plays this sort of down on his luck farmhand who never got a good shake, but he's determined that he deserves better in his life and he's going to go out and take it in by all means necessary. And that's also if that's if that's who Jake's character, Jesse Plemons character is in this film, then, you know, wow, that that's even more tragic because he's just not that character. Yeah. This, it's like you wanted to be that character your whole life. That's a weird choice, too, because, you know, not there's not a lot to that, there's not a lot I like about that character from Oklahoma. He's actually the heavy and he's 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 quite a big asshole. Yeah. Um, but besides that, what other connections besides them doing the play and all? I like I was just trying to figure out that whole fucking thing. The, whole time. Uh, the dance sequence, like the dream sequence. Yeah. I remember, it's a weird trippy sequence in Oklahoma for 1955 where they they sub out the two main actors with stand ins who are actual real dancers. And they have this big, trippy, weird uh, uh, dream sequence, okay. dance sequence. Um, you know, you can say that's that's his that's his schizophrenia, I guess, coming out of of his mind in this movie. You know, and well, if he's from Oklahoma, I'm sure they do the fucking play Oklahoma every other year and sure. every other high school. That so. ties into it, but I'm saying like the 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 when they they bring in other actors that stand in for the two characters, that's his demons, kind of almost. Yeah. You know, his schizophrenia coming out, which also leads to the fact that I mean the it is just it's got to be his movie because it's just it ends being his movie and there's that weird scene at the end when the janitor sort of she's nice to the janitor in the hallway and then he kind of like puts her at ease and then she kind of disappears from the movie pretty much she's yeah. it's not about her trying to search out for anything anymore it takes over and then it's the janitor's movie because he's about to go out and freeze to death yeah, I mean, I want to fucking watch it again. I need to watch <laughs> no, it again. Dude. Like that's, that's basically what it comes down to. Like, if anybody out there is still following along, yeah, we don't know what the fuck we're talking about either. We could be totally wrong. We got to yeah, watch it again. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> this is what we got. But yeah, it's it's uh it's trippy, man. It's it's fun to yeah. to sort of get down to the nitty gritty of what this movie's about. And based on this conversation, there's so much more. And there's there's no right or wrong answer. I would guess here. There's just you'd have to ask the writer. Yeah. You would have to ask. And that just, I think that's no fun in that. No. Yeah. But I mean, but if you have to get, but if you leave it at that point, you never answer it, then you're doing it right. Right. Yeah. It's like the Tarantino what's inside the briefcase thing, which I always thought was bullshit when people were like, I have to figure that out. That's bullshit. It's like, dude, you don't even get the movie, do you? Yeah. It's his soul. It doesn't even, no, shut up. (laughs) It doesn't even matter. You know, it's like, you're going to ruin the whole fun of it. If you know what's inside the briefcase. Yeah. You know, you could, we have conjectures all day long and that's the fun for me. But you know, the people that have to have answers to this stuff and always ask Tarantino in interviews, what's in it. I can understand why he's just like next. Yeah. (laughs) I've done, I'm done saying I'm not going to answer that question. Oh man. But you know, really the movie I would uh, put as a double feature would be Oklahoma. Probably. Okay. Because you know, come on, you know, it's such a big theme in the movie and it's such a contrast to this movie. It'd be fun to play Oklahoma first and then you could watch this movie. Yeah, a little candy before the real meal. Of, you know, Right. Which, interesting enough, the song that he sings from that where he's, I think it's Jed. He plays the character Jed in Oklahoma. Um, that's not in the movie Oklahoma, the number that he performs in this hmm. movie. They cut it They cut it out of the theatrical release, but it's in the play. Gotcha. So, you Alone know. at the driving all over again. It's kind of like that, except from like a redneck farmhand. Yeah. You know, no Danny Zuko. Um, I'm surprised you remember a Grease reference. Why not? I'm a, I am smart. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Yeah, I know. Um, or I would say the Aronofsky movie uh, Mother would be a good double feature for yeah, this. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Because that one, uh, that one, this, but I, this felt like the most like that movie, the reality and the tenseness of it without the violence. Yeah, but I, didn't, I wasn't the biggest fan of that, but I guess, you know. Well, yeah, well, why not though? That's that, if you liked this movie, why wouldn't you like that movie? I mean, from what I remember, I think I remember the ending and the, you know, what, you know, what pans out. I don't want to ruin it for anybody now that we're recommending it. Because it's sort of the same journey. You're going through this, the eyes of this young woman and all this crazy stuff keeps happening to her inside this one cabin with her husband and then people that keep showing up to the house. Granted, it gets way more out there and fucked up as it goes along the way. That's just Aronofsky. Um, and it gets gross. But it, it it sort of psychologically felt like a very similar movie. Okay. Well, I'd have, I'll have to go. I have to watch Mother again. I have to watch this movie again. Shit, man. There's so many new movies I got to see. I got to go back and watch these. I mean, you don't remember Mother, though? I do remember. The, you just remember I, the ending? I remember the one scene with the gross scene. And then I remember the ending with the with the burning in the house. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to spoil it. Fucking, if you never this is how it. you watch movies and you retain no knowledge. <laughs> no, it's because. It's, I don't really remember that movie. I remember the end of it. 
Yeah, I, I remember it was like then when like Ed Harris and Michelle Pfeiffer were like the people that came in off the road and you know they were acting. Build active. the movie's about building tension and uh, dissimilar to what you're doing right now. Well, you know, I just like to put everyone at ease. <laughs> oh, God, that's that's the problem with you. Um, I'm thinking of ending thing is streaming on Netflix. I don't even know if drugs will save you if that's your thing when you watch movies like this. Um, alcohol, maybe not either, because if you're like me and you like a you know a glass of red wine with a movie, um, you know, definitely definitely have like a like an iced tea before you watch it. Do you, your mind, you know, maybe if you if you take your CBD, take some CBD. Um, but your mind needs to be sharp and awake, I would guess, for this one. Because if you're a little sleepy, you're going to be sleepy. Uh, and if you're not seeing this in the theater, which probably most of you aren't, yeah, I would say don't just throw it on frivolously for a Tuesday night with the wife. Yeah, for sure. You know, or husband or girlfriend or whatever it is. Um, this is one where you really have to prepare for just because it's a uh, it's a big leap, but it's a well done leap, and I think that most people, if they give it a chance, they'll discover a new gem like like movies like this in the past. You know, there's there's like co- college dorms love t- dorm room posters were filled with like the fountain and weird you know Requiem for a Dream and those again those are all, we mentioned three Aronofsky movies. Yeah. So yeah, maybe maybe it mirrors that more than it doesn't, but I think people will. Even even normal moviegoers will find this one to be so highly entertaining because they can't dissect it or they can and they like to dissect it with their friends, you know, especially around a certain age when you get a, when you're in that age and you're like, man, just check out the possibilities, Andy's crowd. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I felt was, very targeted. That was my, by, uh, by, by that that was my impersonation of you in college. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. It's a bigger I, picture, man. <laughs> you don't even know. That's right. Expanding mind. <laughs> I want some ice cream, though. But which flavor? Uh, the possibilities are endless. Yeah. Um. Again, check out. Uh, I'm thinking of many things. I think it's a, it's a year top tenner. Oh, for sure. Yeah. If you'll allow me at this point, and it's going to take a few more viewings, but. A damn fine movie for a damn fine podcast. With or without you. What do you mean with or without me? I'm just singing a song. Oh, okay. Um, anything else you want to say about this? No. Nah. I mean, you didn't really say anything in the first place. I, you know, I said more than I thought I was going to say, so I'm going to stick with that. Nailed it. <laughs> right on. <laughs> All right, everybody. We're going to get out of here. Nathan Robert Blackburn and Andy Pesha for the Four Seasons of Film podcast. Have a great night, everybody. And keep film alive.